There are at least three ways to build most EDH decks. Steerong, yeah. Fun, 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 to the fun, and then the fun is the fun. Mm, mean. Mm. Let's take a look at the strong, fun, and mean ways that I would build Esika, God of the Tree. And the video starts right now. Special thanks to our Patreon supporters who power our channel. Check out our Patreon for monthly giveaways, exclusive content, and even a starring role in our fanfight series. Link in the description below. Hello and welcome to the day. Thank you for spending your time with us. Welcome back to another episode of Jake and Joel or Magic. I am Joel. We're going to talk about a Sika God of the Tree and the three ways that I would build this five color commander that's also an enchantment. But first, if you would, go down there. If you like the video by the end of it, hit that like button. And if you don't like the video by the end of it, hit that dislike button. Let's jump over into this commander. Asika, God of the Tree. Two green, one other, one four, Vigi. Tap to add one color of any mana. Other legendary creatures you control have vigilance and tap to add one mana of any color. You've got color correction out of the command zone. You've got mana dork out of the command zone. And the other side of Asika is the prismatic bridge. A green, a red, a black, a blue, a white for a legendary enchantment at the beginning of your upkeep. Reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a creature or planeswalker card. Put that card right onto the battlefield and the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. You're leaning into legendary or planeswalkers here, right? I love a planeswalker support commander right out of the command zone. And so you can, you know, cast it for its mana dork side, ramp up, get some other stuff going. Eventually when it dies, it can come back as the pr prismatic bridge for one of each plus two. But the strong way to build this, I would lean into super friends and let's just go super planeswalkers and a bunch of planeswalker support. For fun way, I would say a legendary sub theme is also very good. Having some legendary support and a bunch of legendary creatures is a very good way to go. And then for the mean way, we're gonna go board wipes and constellation, meaning a lot of enchantments and a lot of board wipes to protect our planeswalkers. Let's look at the strong way. Oh, we're starting with Daddy Bolas here. Nickel Bolas, Dragon God, that passive to have all loyalty abilities of all other Planeswalkers on the battlefield. That is pretty excellent. Anytime we play other Planeswalkers, Nickel Bolas will also gain their abilities and possibly let us double down on some of the most powerful abilities that are on any Planeswalkers that exist. Plus one to draw cards, minus three to destroy target creatures or Planeswalkers, and minus eight each opponent who doesn't control a legendary Planeswalker loses the game. We literally have a win condition just on this one Planeswalker. Let's also run the God Pharaoh. Very strong, very strong Planeswalker. Plus two, have an opponent exile a card from their library, and you get to play that card without paying its mana cost if you'd like. Plus one, each opponent exiles two cards from their hand. Wow, just huge amount of discard on a plus ability on this Planeswalker. It deals seven damage to an opponent or creature an opponent controls for minus four, and then minus 12 is essentially another win con. Exile each non-land permanent your opponents control. That's pretty epic to be able to flip onto the battlefield for free with the Prismatic Bridge and then start using those abilities. Narset Parter of Veils, the minus two is fine, but I do like each opponent can't draw more than one card each turn. There's a lot of good Planeswalkers from War of the Spark with these passive abilities that you should build into your deck and Narsa is definitely one of them, as is Ashiok. Spells and abilities your opponents control can't cause their controller to search their library. Cut off any fetch lands, cut off any tutors. This is a really cut off land ramp, a lot of mana ramp in general. Ashiok is really, really strong, as is Ugin. Now this can be a board wipe. Minus X up to seven exile each permanent with converted mana cost X or less, that's one or more colors. If you just need a reset button, Ugin is huge. Past that, you're lightning bolting every turn to eventually get up to that gain seven, draw seven, put seven onto the battlefield. Ugin is ridiculous and definitely should be run. If we're going to be running super friends, we might as well run the mother of all super friends, Atraxa. We've got the colors to support it, and it's a legendary creature. So the prismatic bridge is also going to flip Atraxa. And plus, we're going to be proliferating, so we're going to get to use the ultimates on our commanders, on our planeswalkers, excuse me, even quicker. And the Chain Veil. At the beginning of your end step, if you didn't activate a loyalty ability of Planeswalker, you lose two life. That's fine because minus or pay four, tap it. For each Planeswalker you control, you can activate one of its loyalty abilities once this turn as though none of its loyalty abilities have been activated this turn. So for four mana and tap, we get to use each Planeswalker twice. 
pretty huge. We also have abilities like Oath of Teferi that let us do that as well. You may activate the loyalty abilities of Planeswalker you control twice each turn rather than only once. A lot of value from all these free Planeswalkers will be flipping onto the battlefield from Prismatic Bridge. And we need to use things like Oath of Tefri to use their abilities more than once. That's the strong way that I would build this deck. I think Planeswalkers is a really good way to go with this if you want to. Let's look at the fun way and go to a legendary sub theme. Kethis is a really good place to start when you're talking about building a legendary deck because legendary spells you cast cost one less to cast. Anything that is going to reduce that cost is pretty excellent. Kethis also comes with the ability for us to play things again that have died. Exile two legendary cards from your graveyard until the end of turn, each legendary card in your graveyard gains, you can play it from your graveyard. Kethis is a great place to start. How about Riki? This is essentially like an enchantress card, but for legendary spells. Whenever you play a legendary spell, draw a card. Keep your hand full. It's a really strong creature to have in your deck so that when you do play ones from your hand, you're able to keep your hand full. Gerard Weatherlight Hero, when it dies, exile it, and then you return to the battlefield all artifacts and creatures in your graveyard that were put there from the battlefield this turn. This is like, whoops, you board wiped? I don't care. All my legendary creatures died? I don't care. Gerard's going into exile. And we're going to return literally everything that you wiped off the board. Captain Cisse is going to tap to search your library for a legend or legendary card. Reveal it, put it into your hand. So we've got this repeatable tutor if they don't answer it. Kamal's Druidic Vow is going to let us dig down and pull stuff up literally from the earth. Look at the top X cards of your library. Put any number of lands and legendary permanents with converted mana cost extra or less from among them straight onto the battlefield. You do need a legendary creature or planeswalker on the battlefield to pull this off to be able to cast this spell but really strong if you're able to. Hero's Podium, each legendary creature you control gets plus one, plus one for each legendary creature you control. So it's sort of this coat of arms, but specifically for legendary creatures. And then it also lets you look at the top X, reveal a legendary creature card and put it into your hand. You have to put the rest on the bottom in a random order, but who cares? We got a free card. Emirate the Lustrous in this deck is so good. Whenever another permanent enters the battlefield, look at the top card of your library. If it shares a card type with that permanent, you can reveal that and put it into your hand. And so if it's a legendary card and you've played a legendary spell, that is pretty excellent if you ask me to just keep your hand full. And then also Helm of the Host. If we're ha gonna have all these legendary creatures on the battlefield, let's be copying them, but the copies don't even count as legendary copies so we can double up on their abilities and gain more value out of the creatures we already have on the battlefield. Past that, kind of like with the strong way to build with the uh, Planeswalker strategy, take your favorite legendary creatures and put them in there. You'll feel as you're playtesting the deck which ones are good, which ones are bad, which ones aren't having enough impact. You're going to want to look at creatures, obviously it's commander, so ETB effects, death effects, things like that. Maybe like Gerard, when it dies, you exile it and return everything to the battlefield. That's the kind of stuff you want to look for for a strong, impactful legendary creature for your commander deck. That's the fun way that I would build this let's look at the mean way and go with a board wipe and constellation build so we're playing a bunch of planeswalkers or we're playing a bunch of legendary creatures how about urza's ruinous blast exile all non-land permanents that aren't legendary we can hit everything except for lands and our legendary stuff now granted legendary stuff on our opponent's side of the battlefield will also survive this but we will probably get a ton of permanents in the crossfire of being able to leave a majority of our board and take out the majority of theirs. Urza's Ruinous Blast, a lot like Kamal's Druidic Vow, you've gotta have a legendary creature or planeswalker under your control, but then you're able to fire it off and it is very, very powerful in a deck like this. And that's sort of what we wanna do in this deck. We wanna wipe the board. We wanna get some planeswalkers onto the battlefield because they will not be hit, be hit by all these cards that say destroy all creatures. We'll continue to build our value and our opponents will have to start rebuilding theirs. Supreme Verdict is a four cost version that can't be countered to destroy all creatures. Merciless Eviction, you get to choose one, exile all artifacts or creatures or enchantments or planeswalkers. Pretty strong there and I like having the modes on that so that you've got some versatility based on what you're doing. Whirlwind of Thought, I mean, whenever you're casting a non-creature spell, draw a card in a board wipe deck like this, or an enchantment sub theme constellation deck, which is the other way that we're going to build this. We want enchantments on the battlefield. We want planeswalkers on the battlefield because they're going to survive our board wipes. Whirlwind of Thought is going to keep our hand full as we're casting these enchantments, and it's going to count as an enchantment for a card that I'm going to show you here in just a second coming up. Smothering Tithe, obviously, if you're building an enchantment deck and you've got access to white, just run Smothering Tithe. It's really strong. Sphere of Safety. This is what I'm talking about with the constellation build. We're going to make it so 
that creatures don't really stick, and even if they do stick, they can't attack us or a planeswalker we control unless their controller pays X for each creature attacking, where X is the number of enchantments you control. So that's our constellation. We build up this web of enchantments that are protecting us from being attacked or protecting our planeswalkers from being attacked, and we wipe off creatures when it gets too much. So occasionally we drop a board wipe, kill all the creatures, other than that, we're building up our defense, we're building up our Planeswalker base, and eventually, hopefully, we're going to get to something like an ultimate on Nicol Bolas, Dragon God, or God Pharaoh, where essentially we're winning the game right then and there. You should also run cards like Ghostly Prison, obviously. This is another one. Creatures can't attack you unless their controller pays two for each creature they control that's attacking you. Stack these abilities. Stack these Pillow Fort style protections as much as you possibly can in this build so that even if creatures do survive, they're going to have a hard time getting through to you. Propaganda is another version of how to stack this. Creatures can't attack you unless their controller pays two for each creature they control that's attacking you. These in, in additive, these on top of each other, is going to be so hard for them to get through, especially while you're building up your Planeswalkers. You've got Prismatic Bridge on the battlefield. You're getting free Planeswalkers, free legendary creatures, however you're leaning that strategy every single turn. This is an excellent way to build this to protect your line and deal with your opponents. That's the strong, fun, and mean ways that I would build a Seeker God of the Tree. Let's close the book. Thank you so much for watching. Like I said, if you like the video, hit that like button. And if you don't like the video, hit that dislike button. That's really great information for me and Jake. Also, let me know down below how you're building a Sika God of the Tree. Being a five color commander, there's a lot of possibility here. And I'm really excited to talk to you about it. Other than that, I'm tapped out and I'll catch you later.